<laughs> so, Leo, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks, Wayne. How are you? <laughs> good, good. Surviving this crazy, crazy time, eh? Yeah, yeah, surviving so far. I think Perth is a good place to be because it's so isolated. There's not really any coronavirus here unless you're on a cruise ship. So I think back in <laughs> London, I was supposed to be back in London now, and there there's just bodies being carried out. It's totally like the plague, like bring out your dead. There's like people dying. So, that must be nuts to see in, in London. Yeah, yeah. And also everybody's like confined to their houses in London, like they are in Perth. Yeah. At least like in Perth, people have big houses and, you know, it's it's sunny. So if you go out to your garden or whatever, you can still go down to the beach. You can still exercise. Yeah. But in London, everybody's crammed into these tiny little tower blocks and uh, just, you know, it must just be so like mentally grueling being rammed in with like, you know... Whole whole family sort of stuck in like just a couple of rooms. So you're trying to hold out here as as long as you can. Yeah, I, I think it's a good idea. Basically, my visa runs out in about ten days. Oh, does and it? yeah, yeah, oh, I better I better deal with that actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm getting a tourist visa, but I've got to pay four hundred dollars. But then I think I might as well just pay four hundred dollars and fly back at the start of May. And, I would. Um, yeah, yeah. Try and delay it as much as you can. Yeah. Because I think <laughs> by the time we start heading into winter, it'll start getting pretty, it could start getting pretty bad here too. Yeah. And by then, hopefully, England will have it a little bit under control. But, yeah, you know, I, I, so. I just heard Boris Johnson just got uh, taken to the hospital today. Yeah. Or yesterday to yeah, do he's, further he's checks. The, he's been in the hospital for a, for a day or two, but he's been taken into in ca- intensive care now. Oh, is that what? Oh, so, shit. yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is a sort of one of the one of the doctors who first um, discovered it and blew the whistle on it in China. Um, he was only thirty three, and he wasn't yes. didn't have underlying health conditions apart from being a bit fat, and he died from it. Yes, he died from it. Age thirty three. So, like, yeah, people do. He was a heavy smoker too, apparently. Oh, right, was yeah. he? Right. Well, I was listening to another podcast and they were saying that, um, you know, places like Italy, yeah. I mean, Greece was another place, but when I was in Italy, I was in Italy in January, Yeah. in the beginning of Jan, everyone smokes, right. you know, right. uh, so a lot of people, a lot of people smoke and they don't know why the fatalities in Germany yeah. have been very low. Yeah. I mean, they're infected. There's quite a few people there infected, but their fatalities are very low. So they were all trying to think of what's happening and they're trying to put it, whether it's smoking yeah. or because a lot of people there don't smoke compared to Italy yeah. and other countries too, you know. Yeah. So oh, that's a crazy well, yeah, time. There's, there's not many in Scotland either, which I guess is a similar climate to, to Germany. But I think it's because people in Scotland, uh, like all, all the people in Italy that were dying were sort of in their 80s and stuff. Whereas in Scotland, we die in our 40s from heroin and alcoholism, so we don't get a chance. <laughs> this is a lesson the world can take. You've got to die young, then you don't get then you don't have this coronavirus problem, you know? Also, our food, nobody's getting nobody's getting coronavirus from Scottish food. I'm not saying it's healthy, but like we're not chopping up bats and putting them in salads. Like All this yeah. stuff is like, we're probably eating bat and pangolin, but it's like processed, full of chemicals, deep fried. No coronavirus is surviving that. Pangolin haggis. Yeah, <laughs> pangolin would be without right the shape. scales, without right the scales. shape for a haggis. Yeah. You know what's funny is I'm I'm sure that nobody knew what the fuck pangolin was a pangolin yeah. was until until now. You well, know, yeah. it starts well, coming one, out. One of the good things that's coming out of the uh, coming out of this coronavirus thing, and there's lots of good things, but one of the good things that's coming out <laughs> is uh, <laughs> one of the good things that's coming out is um, apart from the end of the cruise industry is um, uh, like the the markets aren't going to be selling wild animals anymore. So loads of loads of wild that pangolins, uh, these what are those things with the the flying squirrels with the the sort of wing things? Yeah, loads of these things, bush babies, all these like nice things. Um, otters, loads of otters are taken from the wild and sold as pets yeah. in China and through Southeast Asia, and that's going to stop because it's you know that's how viruses can get can get to humans if you're yeah. handling wild animals and stuff. So I mean that's one of the good because I mean I, just I used to follow all these otters on Instagram because they're just so hilarious, they're adorable, you know, eating like you know cat food and stuff and. I didn't realize that that's actually really unhealthy for them. They shouldn't be eating cat food. They should be. They shouldn't be like swimming in a bathtub, living in somebody's tiny little, you know, Japanese apartment or whatever. They should be like, you know, out in the out. Yeah, swimming about a river. I heard a rumor that they've actually opened up one of those wet markets again. Really? In China? Yeah. How bad yeah. is that? Let's go there. Get some bat salad, man. Let's do it. <laughs> it sell it on the black market. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is one of the things apparently the medical research laboratories, and this is in the New New York Post, which I'm assuming is a sort of you know a, you know plausible publication. They uh, said that researchers in the medical laboratories were taking the carcasses of animals that had pathogens tested on them, like that had you know 
these viruses tested on them, which are obviously supposed to be incinerated. And instead of incinerating them, they were selling the carcasses to the wet markets because they can make money, you know, selling oh, all these. shit. Which is obviously a way, you know, you chop that stuff up, you know, there's viruses there, virus gets out of the animal and, you know, you're not cooking it, you, you're you chopping it on the same thing as some other raw meat, you know, everything can get around. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I read in the New York Post. I don't know if that's entirely true. It's like nature's revenge. Yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, can't, you can't mess with stuff like this. You yeah, gotta, you gotta know, just man. like batter <clears throat> stuff and fry it forever, and then like then you can eat it. Process yeah. it. You eat well, it. Well, change it into dinosaur shapes. Put anything, more salt in. Yeah, put more salt yeah, in. Yeah, salt. You know, salt, <laughs> vinegar, anything like that. Anything that's changed into a dinosaur shape, you know, can't carry coronavirus. They look fucking scary though. Have you seen? You know, did you see them on the plates? Like they showed the bats in all the wet markets and stuff yeah. with their big teeth and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, like, like that doesn't look. That that doesn't look I mean, it doesn't look like there's any meat on it for a start. Maybe the wings taste really crunchy. Yeah. And nice. Yeah. We can't knock bat soup or bat if we haven't tried it, right? Yeah, I haven't tried it. I have eaten quite a lot of um, strange food. Um, Because you're Scottish or because you travel a lot? (laughs) We do eat a lot of strange food in Scotland. (laughs) We've got all this like delicious seafood and stuff, but we send it overseas. We send it to like France and places like that where people have got good taste. Yeah. But I've eaten, um, I ate whale when I was in Norway. Oh, yeah. Norway or Sweden. Norway it must have been. So, um, what was that like? It was actually really tasty. Yeah? Yeah. My mate didn't cook it right. He cooked it like the heat was too low. I think the cup we had, it wasn't fatty. So it was just like steak and he cooked it too low. So it went sort of cooked through and a bit dried out. Is that, well, is illegal, t- illegal or legal? It's legal in Norway. They sell it in the supermarkets. And I understand some people have got, you know, the, the thing is, like, I don't understand. People, some people are like, oh, you can't eat dogs, but then they'll eat pigs. And pigs are just like yeah. dogs that have been shaved and have a different shaped face. You and a curly I mean? tail. They've got a curly tail. Yeah. They're like intelligent animals. They're really sociable. They're really nice. Pigs are intelligent. Yeah, and they make great pets as well. And um, so it's, it's very, sort of, you know, there's this sort of cultural supremacy thing going on. And with whales, I think it's more ethical to eat a whale because it's huge. So you kill one whale, that's like killing a hundred cows. Yeah, true. So the whale's huge, and people say they're smart. If they're that smart, work out a way to build a machine gun so we don't eat you. You know what I mean? <laughs> so they're not not—they're not like, you know, they might be smart, they might sing to each how, other, whatever. How, um, how, um, and plus, how do we miss a whale? Yeah. Yeah, and they're, they're huge. I've never seen a whale. I've never seen a whale. <laughs> I've seen people raising money for whales. I've never seen one. <laughs> I've never actually. I've seen them. I've I've seen them. Uh, saw, saw them in Canada. I've seen them in Scotland. Just coming up and like doing the. Psh, uh, that's an amazing up. thing to see. Oh, I've yeah, seen that on wicked. YouTube and stuff. Yeah, and yeah. Thought, oh, imagine seeing that. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's a weird thing. It's a, I had a guy on here that just finished a documentary for Discovery Channel, and uh, it was on the rhino poaching. Oh right. It was incredible. I mean, the doco hadn't been released yet. Yeah. But. They actually went not just on the side of the poacher, like they got a poacher out of jail and interviewed him. Right. And it's just a huge amount of money. Yeah. Like two rhinos that were getting 30,000 US dollars. And for right. guys that are starving and trying to feed their family. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot of money. Yeah. But then they went to the receiving end yeah. in China where these rich Chinese businessmen were buying these rhino horns on the black market yeah. and stuff. And it was like the drug industry. They sort of, one way was to legalize... <clears throat> Because they don't know whether rhino horn grows back. Oh, right. So when you cut it, so you can the horn grows it. back, so you can harvest it. Right, no way. So when you push it out on the market legally, yeah. it brings all the black market down. Right, and then it's not lucrative enough to Then it's not lucrative enough, to, enough to, right. to risk your life for. And also, also That was they, China again. Yeah, yeah. And can mm. they change this? Because I know they've done some work around um, shark fin, trying to make shark yeah. fin soup less sort of attractive to people. Because it is a waste. You know, they just cut the fin off the shark, chuck the shark back in the water. That's They're horrible, just eating the fin. And that's pointless. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's At least horrible. eat the whole shark. I know, I know. Especially after bringing it up. Yeah, you know, it's a lot of work bringing a shark up on a... Yeah. On a th- and that, have you ever seen a shark? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've dived with sharks. They're like, they're oh, amazing, yeah? amazing animals. Yeah. yeah. I've seen one in the wild, like off the coast here in Perth. Yeah. It's the scariest bloody well, thing you to saw see. you're in the water with Yeah. Blame yeah. me. No and, and, you know, South Africa and, and Australia yeah. are the places where the great whites are. Yeah. You know, I had a dolphin go through my legs in the ocean. Right. And I didn't know whether it was a dolphin. Because any big fish, yeah, just to me, like things shape. this thing can kill you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So were you swimming? Yeah, You're I was swim- sitting on a surfboard. 
Right. First time surfing, trying right. to learn how to surf. And the hardest thing was sitting on the board yeah, yeah. just to get your balance. Yeah. And this thing went through my legs. Never got in the ocean again. <laughs> 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 you grew up in film, you know. The, what's the first thing that comes to mind is freaking Jaws, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Listen, I hear you You also did criminal intelligence. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What in? What doing and how did you get into that? So, well, fun enough, when I, I, I studied film, then I moved to Canada to work in film because they make so many films there. Um, but then I, I started working for a dot-com company right. and uh, just got into um, like, learning how to program and all this sort of stuff. So when I came back, um, I started working in public data and criminal intelligence. And yeah, for a while I was working criminal criminal intelligence in the sort of... Um, uh, the sort of 10 years up to about 2000, uh, 2010, 2012 was really exciting because we were bringing in all these new methodologies uh, from America, like uh, problem solving, policing, diamond districts, all this stuff that's like the wire um, was, was being brought in to, to treat uh, crime as a public health problem. So we're taking a very sort of intelligence led approach to, right. to crime. Because uh, so, many, so many crime problems, the, the traditional police response, if you've got like, a crime problem, they just throw yellow jackets at it and arrest people. But that doesn't deal with the actual underlying cause True. of the problem. Like people are still going to go out and, and commit the crimes. And uh, also it makes our crime statistics go up and it's, you know, hugely costly. So what we started doing was treating crime as a sort of public health problem and looking across all the public agencies to see who had the resources to deal with it best. So we had um, one, one of the parts of London I was working in, we had a problem with nighttime disorder. The clubs were ent emptying out and people were milling around, fighting, you know, getting in all sorts of bother. So uh, the traditional response was just to go there and arrest people, which, you know, was just, that's never going to deal with the problem. What we found was, did some uh, analysis and found that the, uh, the problem was that people weren't leaving the area in time. All the clubs were kicking out at the same time. There's no transport routes out. This is before Uber existed. So what we did was we uh, changed, we staggered the the leaving times of the clubs uh, and put in a taxi rank and also changed the bus routes. They, they stayed open later and uh, told the, we made the shop shut so it wasn't selling bottles to people that they could use as weapons. And just those few small things, very cheap things to do, like totally dealt with the, the problem that all this uh, wow. violence and antisocial behavior. Yeah, that's so cool. It, it was just about finding like cheap solutions to, to public problems. And I think now the government sort of cut back um, on criminal intelligence and now we're seeing the rise of gang crime. Like I used to map all the gangs uh, in Harringay. I used to map them out in, uh, in Westminster as well. So we knew exactly who was doing what and, you know, who the sort of key people were. And who to target with? Because a lot of it is uh, a lot of it is people you can, uh, you know, you can target without arresting or anything like that. You can mm. sort of target them and do. Um, you can speak to the parents because a lot of the times it's like kids that are like fifteen years old and stuff. Yeah. You can do diversionary things. We used to uh, put a bus on and take all the problem kids to uh, Alton Towers for uh, fireworks night. So I used to I used to think it was a bit like you know we're rewarding them. <laughs> For being horrible little shits, you know what I mean. Yeah, come see a fireworks show. Yeah, there's these, there's these, uh, there's these other kids that are just like you know being good kids and like studying and stuff, and they're not getting to go to Alton Towers. They're not getting to go to the the fun fair <laughs> because they're they're being good. But you know, but it did work. It worked. You know, for the price of like you know hiring a bus and taking these kids to Alton Towers would save a lot of you know stabbings and robberies and all the rest of it. And it's an incentive to do crime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You want to go see fireworks? Yeah. Come rob, come rob me. <laughs> it was weird because my sister, I, I was born in London and my yeah. sister was in a gang. She's 10 years older than me. Right. And one of the reasons why we moved to Australia is because they were thinking, look, if this is how bad it's going to get. Yeah. We grew up in Brixton too. Right. Which would have been rough. Back then. Uh, yeah. This was in the... This was in the seventies and eighties. Oh right, blame yeah. Me. yeah. So it was, it was, you know, it was tough. Yeah. But I was, I was just born. I was like five years old, and yeah. I think my parents are thinking, if it's going to be like this now with with our daughter, can yeah. you imagine our son? So one of the reasons, one of them was th that was one of the reasons because it was yeah. pretty rough back then. I've heard it's changed. I've heard that Brixton's quite a trendy place now. Yeah, it's very cafes. Trendy. Yeah, some people are complaining that it's becoming gentrified. Like my mate Nico, like he lived there I've heard. Mm. for a, for a while, and uh, yeah, like people people say it's um, it's sort of pushing out the original residents. But um, I don't know. Like people complain about gentrification, but the other hand is, you know, the other side of it is. 
It's getting nicer. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you can't, you can't it's hard, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's freaking hard. It was the same in Harlem. Right. I was in, uh, in Harlem uh, in 2001 for a film festival. One of my films was, was in a festival in New York. And uh, we told the guy at the Backpackers in, you know, we're at the Backpackers at a hostel. And he was an Aussie guy that was working there. He'd been working there for two years. And I said to him, we just went to Harlem today to have some soul food. And he goes, mate, I've lived here four years. I've never stepped foot in there. <laughs> we, we didn't know. But it was weird. We got off there and we're the yeah. only non-black people there. Right, yeah. So, and we were mistaken as more Puerto Rican or Mexican. Right, yeah. So it wasn't healthy. Yeah. But the minute they heard us speak, they just thought, oh, they're crazy, crazy Aussies, you know, just coming <laughs> here. But when we went back, yeah. I went, we went back in 012, completely changed. Right. Like there were cafes and little waterfalls and, and yeah, the yeah. tenants were complaining there again, prices were going up, everything's yeah. been pushed back. And there is a bad and good side to it too, because yeah, you know? yeah. otherwise what do you do? Yeah. You I'm know? sure coronavirus is sorting out the rising oh, rents. Man. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but in London, the rents have come down a third already. It's crazy. Yeah. All the Airbnb, nobody's like making money from Airbnbs anymore. So. Actually, I forgot about Airbnb. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. Like, you know what's crazy about this whole thing is – they they say that the effects of what we're going through now is only going to be felt at the end of this year and next year. You know, all these stimulus packages that are coming out. Right. They're called stimulus. They're really rescue packages. Yeah, yeah. And the money's coming from somewhere. Yeah. Well, it's, it's Keynesian economics. We're basically borrowing from the future to sort of, you know, just create yeah. a bit of, you know, cushion. And we have to, we have right to pay now. for that. Yeah, We have yeah. to pay for that. So I, do you think there's going to be a world recession? Oh yeah, I mean there all there already is. Uh, the, and the the thing is, um, like the demand isn't going to pick up for a while for a lot of things. Like my industry, my industry, ninety percent of my money just comes from live performing. Yeah. So that's not coming back for a while because uh, even in in China where they've like lifted the restrictions, uh, they've they've opened the restaurants and the cinemas. Uh, people are still scared to go. Yeah, so the average right. the average attendance right now for cinema in China is four person four people. Per, oh, per film, really? like it's, it's insane. Per screening, four people. Uh, restaurants are, you know, empty. So everybody's scared of being. Shit. And stand up only really works when people are like really cheap by jowl, like crammed in there, like one unit. Yeah. So, and, you know, we're in these like, you know, real dense, like everybody's breathing each other's farts, you know. Yeah, I'm amazed yeah, we haven't yeah. all died from like we're catching stuff up each other. <laughs> but that's other the already. atmosphere, isn't it? But yeah, that's what, that's, that's how stand up works. So, uh, so yeah, it's looking, it's looking pretty grim for stand up and all sort of live events. And uh, also hospitality um, and travel. travel, and that, that, mm. that accounts for so much of the economy these days. I know. So at the moment, they're, they're, all the factories are back online in China. They're all humming, but nobody's out there. Nobody's out there shopping. Nobody's yeah. out there going to restaurants and stuff. So yeah. the demand side isn't going to pick up for a while. I said that to my wife the other day. I said, even though we recover and this whole Corona thing starts to die yeah. down, it's going to be a while before people start going out and giving each other hugs. Yeah, you know, it's just. And that's what we were so used to doing, especially yeah. the Australians, you know. Yeah. But now it's just weird. It's just yeah. weird. And I think it will take a while for that confidence, that public confidence to yeah. come out where people start getting into pack cinemas again, yeah. going to comedy clubs, you know. Yeah. Um, how does someone go from where you were to comedy? Um, I just started doing it. Because just... as you brought it up, I'm sure listeners, I mean, the listeners that probably yeah. know you, you've got quite a good presence online, mate. Oh, cheers. Yeah, yeah, no, when I heard your name uh, that, you know, uh, Stacey said, why don't you yeah. get Leo on? So the first thing I did is I just Googled you in and I was like, holy shit. So you've been doing the, the circuit for, for a while now, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I started 10 years ago. I was, I was shit for um, a good sort of four or five years, like really terrible. Um, and then I quit my job. So after I was a criminal intelligence analyst, I spent five years working as a consultant. I was actually working for the intelligence wing of a... A weapons manufacturer and we were doing a lot of sort of police uh government military stuff um and so i was working for the foreign office and all these uh you know government agencies um but yeah while while i was doing that i started doing started doing stand-up and just really enjoyed it and i always just saw it as like something i did for fun i just really enjoyed the adrenaline buzz of like it's like jumping out of a plane you know you've got that ah, you get on the stage <laughs> it's like oh you know yeah and then you got you know afterwards you feel like you're totally buzzing and stuff and also coming up with new bits and also comedians are you know all my friends now are uh comedians have made some you know they're just a lot of them are fun interesting people um, a lot of them are really depressing and boring as well but um 
<laughs> but yeah, so like I was sort of, you know, it became my sort of social life and stuff. But then I sort of realized you can make money at it. And then I started making money and then I quit my job, quit my, wow, my day job. that's awesome. And uh, which was a bit of a jump. I didn't have, you know, the thing is I was, I was living in London. I was making like good money as a consultant, but I still couldn't buy a house. And I was like, well, what's the point making all this money if I can't buy a house? You know, my living costs when I, without a mortgage are really low. I don't, you know, I yeah. don't spend a lot of money. All this stuff I like doing is pretty much free. So I was like, well, I might as well quit and like do comedy. I don't have any kids or anything. So I quit. To do it. I quit to, and as soon as I quit, I, you know, it spurs you to become better, to write better stuff, to try different things and uh, work harder. And then I started making more money. And um, yeah, now it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, Totally viable. So, so you can, so you are now making a living with stand-up comedy. Yeah, yeah. That's like fantastic. A, I like a good living. I've got, you know, uh, I've got an Audi, brand new Audi. Oh. You know, <laughs> brand new, bright red. Say no more. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Brand new secondhand Audi, and uh, yeah, like um, I mean, like for the next year. Maybe two years. It's going to be tough. Like oh, the good times are really rolling. The good. Oh man, it was unreal. The comedy scene in the UK it just reached this like perfect like equilibrium. There was just all these gigs and all these doubles. You can go and do like two gigs. Sometimes I, I remember one night in London, I did seven shows in one night. And uh, you know, at the time, I was like, oh, it's always going to be like this, you know. And then this comes along, and then it's all it's all gone. Like I just hope all these comedy clubs open up again. I think they will. Yeah, I hope so. I think they hope will. people get back to it because, because uh, yes. Yeah, what, what what are the differences? Do you know? It's funny you said you've been doing it ten years. I was speaking to Sean uh, Conway, yeah, and he said it's he said it's around a ten year apprenticeship. Yeah, where you once you hit around the ten years, you really start coming into your own lane. Yeah, and your own style and yeah. what you're doing, you know, and obviously that's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What what are the differences in audiences? between this side of the world and England? Um, there's actually a difference between Perth and Adelaide. Um, and England, uh, I mean, there's, there's a different, different gigs have different vibes. Like some of them get like, in, in London, you get like a very sort of um, intelligent, but like uh, quite uh, triggery crowd, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So they can get offended at stuff. Um, <laughs> and then you go out to the sticks and they're like, oh yeah, you can do yeah, it's just, uh, just racist stuff, you know? And you're like, dude, like, I don't, <laughs> don't actually have any. I mean, obviously I do, but I'm never saying it out loud, you know? <laughs> but, but comedy, you can. I've got stuff from when I was at school, but, like, you yeah. know, I'm not saying yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I know. But, and, uh, yeah, like, I mean, I, I don't know, like, people say, like, certain gigs, like, you've got to dumb stuff down, you get stag dues, you get hen dues in, but what I've found is, like, if people have paid, like, £15, if people have paid, you know, whatever, $30 or whatever to go out and see comedy um you can there, there are people who want to they don't want to just hear dick jokes they they want to hear something that like i put i put with I a do, point of view yeah i do political stuff in there i do stuff that's quite you know um quite confront confrontational and stuff and people go with it um i've noticed there's a big difference between perth and adelaide uh i have a better time performing in perth than i do in adelaide i find perth is a more sort of it feels younger you got more of a sort of Wild West feel. There's like young people making money on the mines and stuff. Uh, yeah, whereas true. Adelaide, Adelaide is a very sort of feels very middle aged, middle class. People are kind of dumpy and like they just want basic stuff. And, you know, they don't want to be challenged. And, uh, yeah, they just want, you know, some basic jokes that they can yeah. like, home. So I prefer, I prefer Perth. Unless there's anybody from Adelaide listening, in which case I prefer Adelaide, for you, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so you think it's like the disposable income where people are a bit more risque and like just give us something, you know? Yeah, and this, people people are a bit more because I mean my stuff's quite uh, quite right wing, quite counter culture, quite counter cultural. Like I do stuff about why Donald Trump is a great president. And uh, so, oh, there's all these comedians. All these comedians be like, oh, Donald Trump is an idiot. Oh, no, fucking, you, thanks for your insight. Oh, what a fucking, oh, I'm learning. I'm learning here. Do you, do you know what I mean? I've always said? At least we've got someone entertaining. Right? Exactly. He's hilarious. <laughs> you see the other day when the woman was like that, uh, do, don't you think you're being racist? You know, and he's like, uh, he's like, no, it comes from China, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the way he says China as well, he goes, no. It comes from China. <laughs> and do you know what? He's fucking right. Yeah, yeah, it does come from China. Well, you don't say the Spanish, you've got the Spanish flu, yeah. you've got, you know, you got MERS, which yeah. is like Middle East. Yeah. I mean, 
I, but again, he's just, I mean, he's a dick, but he's like, compared to the other dicks we've had, I mean, the other presidents, like, uh, Obama was a statesman. Yeah. Like he was what you expect to be a, oh, a president yeah. standing at, I you know. I feel safe. I feel safe. You know what I mean? I'd be lying there coughing up a lung from coronavirus. I'd be like, I don't care. Obama's yeah. got uh, this. Obama's got know? this. He'll drop drones everywhere, dr- <laughs> <laughs> drone bombs everywhere, he's but he's done. got it. He's got to be done. But he you sounds... can't have the, they can't have these weddings. You know what I yeah. mean? These weddings need to get blown apart. <laughs> yeah. Is... But if he's like a statesman, I feel safe looking at Obama. Yeah, and, yeah. and George W. Bush was, was just boring all round. Yeah. Um, but when Donald Trump got in, <laughs> yeah. I know there was another, there was another comedian, an Aussie comedian, Jim Jeffries. And he did that famous stand up. Um, it was on YouTube and he just said, you know, Donald Trump, but fuck it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> It'll be entertaining, you know? Yeah. And, oh, uh, and what's the bet? Yeah. He'll get in again. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I if mean, he's going thing, up against Biden or whatever. Yeah, the only thing that could really screw him up is the fact that, you know, the the economy was doing so well, it was humming along, yeah. and his response to coronavirus, because Donald Trump is very much a sort of, he's not a socialist, he's, the, he's not, you know, doesn't want to tell people what to do. So, and, you know, the coronavirus is sort of, the sort of thing that needs a bit of a socialist, needs a bit of a state response. Yeah. So there could be a total explosion. You need a general in there. Stuff. Yeah, you need somebody who's going to like, you know, like the NHS, you need, um, you know, mass health care for everybody and stuff to, to deal with it and ameliorate the impact. Whereas Donald mm. Trump's like, you know, now nah, we need to just sort of, you know, people are going to die, but we need to like get back to work. And By Easter. Down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the minute he said, well, he's a, he's a capitalist, he's a business guy. Yeah, and I just love how, you know, he'll come out, like, his, uh, he comes out and he says, like, oh, yeah, so there's this new advice, uh, you've all got to wear face masks. Uh, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, the, he doesn't give a fuck, yeah, hey? Yeah. He just doesn't give. And yeah. I think, I think there was one speech that he, he did about, it was about the tariffs, I think, on China. And he says, look, there's one way to do it. I don't know if you've seen this. There's one way to do it. You've got to pay 15%. I think it was something yeah. like that. Or you do it this way. Listen, motherfuckers. <laughs> and he said, it was his speech as a president. And he's like, listen, motherfuckers, Amazing. you're going to pay 15%. And, Amazing. But a lot of people like that. They yeah. didn't want this, this, um, this fake politician That's the thing. figure. Yeah. Suddenly he was someone that people related to that they they could go, this guy's a real guy. Yeah, yeah. You know. Because Hillary was the ultimate po- epitome yeah. of that fake sort yeah. of, you know, always smiling, doing that fake smile and just yeah. saying stuff that's very carefully calculated <laughs> to be, the, clothing, to be the right thing that, you know, people want to yeah. hear. And, you know, the, I don't, the, the thing I love about Trump is uh, he does, he's, he's authentic and he just yeah. comes out and says, you know, and stuff that if for anyone else, it would destroy their career. But for him, it just en- enhances him. Yeah, because he admits it. Yeah. And he's got that he doesn't, natural. He doesn't hide from it in yeah. that way. And, you know, we're not saying... He is a dick, but he says that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's not pretending he's not a dick. <laughs> so you can't. It's like you can't like hit Crue. him. This is why you know Motley Crue and uh, the Rolling Stones got away with their all their you know horrific sex crimes and stuff. Whereas other people who uh, like Aziz Ansari, who like comes out and he pretends he's oh I'm so nice I'm a feminist oh you got to treat women right and then like in real life. In real life, that woman like goes back to his hotel. He's getting his dick out. He's like, yeah. you know, I'll try, just try to fuck her, just treating her like a piece of meat. So he deserved to be taken down from that. Motley yeah. Crew are just open about it. They're like, yeah, we're gonna fuck you. We're, we're gonna stars. get our dicks out. We're we're gonna, I got my dick out right now. You know what I mean? I've got a <laughs> coke lined up, and it do coke off my dick right now. <laughs> and they're you respected know? for that. I respect them for that. That's yeah. honest. It's like Donald Trump. He's like, yeah, yeah, I'll let prostitutes piss on me. <laughs> yeah, shagged all these women. Yeah, fucking, why wouldn't I? I'm a fucking, I'm the president, baby. You and know? they <laughs> thought they could take him down with that. Yeah. He's like, fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, actually, yeah, this guy, he's Motley Crue. <laughs> Teflon Donald, you know, nothing can nothing can stick to him, you know. Yeah. He's just that he admits it, you know. Yeah, and he's got that natural sort of stand-up comedians uh, thing. Like some somebody accused them. Uh, they said in a press conference, "Oh, you've been Donald Trump. You've been recorded as uh, saying calling women uh, whores and sluts and ugly. Uh, what do you have to say to that?" And he's like, "No, no, no, just Rosie O'Donnell." <laughs> <laughs> like, I can't write stuff that funny. You know what I mean? That's amazing. <laughs> I love it because he didn't deny it. Yeah, yeah. But he literally just, he just turned. Don't... To, he just turned it towards one one woman. You yeah, know? he just owned it. Yeah, just owned and, it. and he owned it. And I think you've got to do that yeah. these days. You know, I I don't know. I think there's a change in the. <laughs> With the, you know, with coronavirus coming through, 
I yeah. just think there, there's going to be a massive change in whatever. You know what scares me, though? I was looking at this guy from Harvard. He was a professor in Harvard giving yeah. a TED Talk. And he was talking about how situations like this in the past where you've got a reigning superpower yeah. and an up-and-coming uh, up and coming country that will take over. You know they're going to take over. Yeah. Going back to the Roman Empire, to Spain and <coughs> – excuse me um, – Better, it's weird coffee. to cough. Hey? <laughs> <laughs> you cough, you feel guilty, you know. <laughs> no, because you know, I sh I shouldn't do this, but every time before a podcast, I'll have a coffee. Yeah. Um, and I've got uh, coffee mate instead of milk. Right. But it just makes it makes you really flimmy. And every time before a podcast, I'm like, I shouldn't. I should just have a black coffee. Yeah. I'll always put the coffee made in and I just don't learn my lesson. <laughs> and and anyway, this guy was saying that it always, something like this is what's happening now is always proceeding to a war. Yeah. He said that out of the last 22 times uh, or 16 times, 12 of those where you've got the reigning superpower and that, um, a third party comes in and sparks a war that no party of this wanted, like China and America. They don't want to go to war, yeah. but something happens, like what's happening in the South China Sea now with China, you know, since this coronavirus is happening, they're, they're taking over more islands over there. Right. And that just scares the shit out of me because whenever yeah. America, especially the United States, gets pushed into a corner, it's going to be a war. Yeah. You know? It lashes out. Yeah. No, I, mean, I, I was, I was kind of hoping that the, the the global sort of supply chains with all our economies are sort of dependent on each other. And also there's just so much travel and stuff between countries. That's going to sort of be the mesh that binds the world together. Mm. So we can't have war in China because we, that's where we get all our iPhones they're, and televisions they're the world's from. factory. And they're yeah. not going to they're not going to attack America because they own so many American bonds. So like they're, all their finances are tied yeah. to America. Uh, Europe's not going to attack anybody because we're we're not capable of it anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> hey, so. I heard what what's the deal with Scotland? Um, <clears throat> sounded like Seinfeld. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> what's the deal with Scotland? You know, because I know after the Brexit thing, did yeah. I thought. Did Scotland want to stick with the EU? Well, or? Scotland, uh, yeah, Scotland definitely wants to stick with the EU. Uh, we voted, I think it was 60, 66% or, so, or something to stay with the EU. And um, uh, and we had our own independence referendum a few years back uh, to have uh, see if we wanted independence from England right. uh, or from, from Britain. Um, and obviously Brexit gives it more of a sort of cause to have that independence referendum again. I mean, I'm, I'm not for, I'm opposed to Brexit and I'm opposed to Scotland leaving, um, leaving the UK. I think what Scottish people don't, I mean, I hate to talk to people like this, but it's what Scottish people don't understand is that we're, we're running a lot of the UK. When I worked in government and policing, and consulting and stuff in, in London, there's so many Scottish people, especially in, in the police and in the government, because so many like so many people come out of the army. There's loads of Scottish people in the army for some reason. I think it's because there's uh, the jobs in Scotland are pretty shit. But uh, so many Scottish people come out of the army and then go into the police or go into government. Sure. Um, so we're already like really enmeshed throughout Westminster. We've had, uh, I mean, like the last few prime ministers. Um, Gordon Brown, I mean, this is going back a while now. I guess, yeah, I know, yeah. Gordon, Gordon Brown, Scottish, Tony Blair uh, was educated in Fetis uh, in, in Edinburgh. So, the, you know, Scot Scotland's sort of really, you know, driving. Uh, we've got a big influence in the UK. And if, mm. if Scotland wasn't part of the UK, man, we'd be like, we're just going to be like a total irrelevance. We're going to be like this tiny, shitty little country. That makes whiskey and you know shags cheap. There's nothing. There's nothing about <laughs> Scotland, you know, unless we're part of the UK. And I feel the same way as uh, I feel part the same the way EU. with the UK and the EU. EU. Yeah, mm. yeah, because we, we're a, a big, a big part of the EU. One of the strongest voices in it had a big uh, steer, and you know how the and a, a really useful steer, making sure you know because Britain's got a very sort of libertarian, uh, free market. Um, attitude. So that was a big, uh, a big influence on the EU and, and necessary because so so many countries in the EU you know tend towards socialism, which never ends never ends particularly well. So yeah, I just I just want everybody to to stick together. Basically. Yeah, I and think it, especially during this time. And it's funny you see people complaining about like oh we're having like one world government. It's like yeah. That'd be a brilliant idea. I'd love a one-world government. You think you're going to get a war with a one-world government? 
<laughs> like, you're gonna fight like one wing, like the what the environmental department's gonna fight the blooming Department of Housing. Like, no, I know that's an amazing idea. Like the amount of prosperity we've got at the moment. I think people, the thing is, we haven't had a disaster. We haven't had a big war in so many decades. People have forgotten that yeah. bad things can happen. Yeah. Maybe coronavirus, if if it's got yeah. like any good effects, it'll be the um you know people have realised that bad things can happen and and it's it's really unpleasant. I brought this up yesterday with Stacey. I said right. uh, they're calling it the long sleep. Right. I heard this guy, Eric Weinstein, on a podcast, on Joe Rogan's podcast. He's a, a hyper-intelligent guy. Yeah. And he was talking about this thing called the big sleep, that we just don't know what tragedy is mm. anymore. You know, where you value the, 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 the simple things like mm. family, friends, the, you know, not the, the Ferraris or the, the jobs. And yeah. it's literally, I'm happy to be alive yeah. after World War II. Look, I just want to sit in a park and eat yeah. a sausage roll yeah. <laughs> and not think about bombs and, yeah, you know, it's yeah. those simple things. Yeah. And we've been in a long sleep. Yeah. We don't know what that is like anymore. And that's why over the last 10 so, years, people have been complaining about all this totally irrelevant offend, stuff. Like, offend, you know, offend like, microaggressions, trigger warnings, safe spaces. is fuck Pronouns. You've, you're living in a fucking safe space already. But you have to admit, that's gold to your industry. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it is. Although I, I did get banned uh, from a venue at the Perth Fringe last hey, year. Hey, was that to do or, with the trans uh, gender? Yeah, was it yeah. transgender or trans? Yeah, it was transgender. Yeah, I was accused of transphobia for some uh, material I did. Because um, basically, the the previous show I did, right wing comedian, I was talking about uh, male privilege because everybody bangs on about male privilege, but I think it's tough being a man. That's why so many of us are transitioning to women right now. <laughs> and uh, obviously, <laughs> it's actually way harder for somebody like me. <laughs> It's way harder for a man to transition to being a woman than it is for a woman to transition to being a man. Like, if a woman wants to transition to being True. a man, in a lot of cases, she just stops shaving, you know? Yeah. Or she, <laughs> she takes hormones, she grows a beard, and people might be like, I think that man's got tits, you know? There's some pretty, pretty ugly fucking men that, <laughs> yeah. are, that well, are transferring to women. Well, yeah, and like... the. As a man trans transitioning to a woman, and it's, it's got a serious basis. Like, as a man transitioning, I'm six foot six. I've got hands like fucking moose antlers. I'm not gonna, nobody's gonna believe that I'm a woman. You know what I mean? <laughs> Whereas you do get small, effeminate men. So, yeah. like, a woman can transition <clears throat> to being a to being a man. Like, in a, you know, I think it works. It works a lot easier in Asia because the women there, the men there are quite petite. Yeah. So if <clears throat> if you go to Thailand, I mean, some of the most the most beautiful women you see there are often guys. Yeah. They they was it lady boys? Yeah, they call yeah. them lady boys. Uh, Western countries not so much. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like it's hard. It's harder. I'd well, yeah, say to get I mean, away with. You know. There's yeah. I mean, I think there's uh, there's some transgender women who really want to be women. Like I dated a transgender woman, and she really wanted to be. She was. She was. Know, she yeah. was a woman. You know what I mean? Yeah. But then there's other transgender women who just want to put on a frock and then demand that everybody calls him a woman. And it's like, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, that's not, this, you gotta like, at least, you know, there's so much work. Like the last year I was dating, she put so much work into, into becoming a woman, like surgery, hormones, uh, everything to the, you know, removing all the, uh, any hair and stuff. Yeah. It's a, it's, so, it's a massive thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, but I, I yeah. wrote, I wrote the material, uh, that I got banned. I wrote the material that got me banned uh, with her because she's, you know, she's hilarious. She's, uh, in fact, she does a she does a podcast as well, and she does like you know TV. And she, she, you know, we wrote loads of comedy together. Um, and uh, even though I'd written it with a transgender woman, like nobody checked, nobody, they just assumed that because I was a, a guy saying this stuff about transgender people, then it must be coming from a bad place, not an informed place, and not you know written with a transgender person. Did you get your side your side out there? No, I just uh, I just got banned. Just a knee jerk reaction. Oh, my my venue shit. turned around and said, uh, "You need to leave. This is an inclusive space." Which uh, straight stra stra straight away definition. <laughs> that's ironic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that because you know what? That's one of the first things when I when I knew you were coming on, mm. and I was I looked it up on Google. That's the yep. first thing I freaking saw. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was. It was Stacy that turned around and said, "Yeah, but you know, Leo did write it with his ex-partner yeah. who was a transgender." Yeah, and I was like, "Well, you just don't hear that." But yeah, but honestly, I think it's gold for comedians anyway. I mean, if you yeah. can't have a laugh yeah. about stuff, yeah, that is serious. Yeah, you know, it's not if you can't even do that, and what you're doing is just putting more of a light-hearted feel on it, so yeah. people can deal with it better. Yeah, and I think humor is the way people process things and deal with it. And also you can't like, 
you know, people people say, oh, you shouldn't make fun of this stuff. And it's like, how could I, if it's so correct, if it's so watertight and perfect, if all this like microaggressions, trigger warnings, all this safe space stuff, all these millennials complaining about cultural appropriation and stuff, they're, if they're so right, why is it funny when I make fun of it? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if, if it was right, there wouldn't be any, like, there wouldn't be any holes I could like, you know, wedge in and like, you know, crack it open. Do you think it's a generation thing? Do you think it's more of a younger generation thing? Maybe, yeah. Because you, you're in your 40s now, right? Yeah, I am. I just had a hair transplant, though, so I look about 27. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to say, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm late 40s. I'm 48 right. at the moment. That's how we were at school. Yeah. We took the piss out of anybody. Yeah. And you just dealt with it and had a laugh. Like, like I got, to, I, I, I was the, probably one of the only half Asian guys at my school. Right, yeah. And... We were giving it to the Italians and then yeah, the yeah. Italians were giving it to the Greeks and yeah, then the yeah. Greeks were giving it to, the, but everybody were friends Yeah, because everybody was, t it was tongue in cheek, Yeah, but you, to the younger generation, I don't think you can do that anymore. Yeah, they like instantly get offended and they go run into teacher. This is the thing that this is the thing that, that does my nutting. Like when we were at school, if you went run into teacher and were like, oh miss, miss, uh, that that boy who made fun of me, you know, from um, I've got a whatever funny shaped head or whatever, you know, like if you did that, everybody be like, oh you fucking dick. Yeah. And now they're all encouraged to do that. They're I all know. encouraged, and they all think it's good to like go run into teacher. And this whole Twitter, every like Twitter storm around, you know, somebody says something. That's all people just run into teacher and be like, oh, this person said this and it's bad. I think it's racist or sexist or homophobic and it's very offensive to me. It's like, fucking stop being a fucking prick. Like, Jesus yeah. Christ, just let people... And also, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody says, like, you know, stuff that's, yeah. like, wrong. Everybody's, like, you know, a dick sometimes. So just have a yeah. bit of kindness and, yeah. like, stop, you know, coming but, down you know, on people. when they leave school, yeah, the world is not like that. The world like, isn't like, like that. Like university. Yeah, the I, minute they leave uni... Their first day on a building site, like... <laughs> <laughs> in an office. Yeah, yeah. It's not like that. Yeah, I wonder it if offices are changing now, though, like to become uh, it more. It depends. Because I've worked, I've worked with people. I mean, obviously, working in the public sector, you mm. know, maybe it's more of a sort of um, you get more of those sorts of people. But like, um, I've worked with people who are all like, oh, actually, that's offensive, you know, and like also who wouldn't. I remember there's a guy. I was like, I was told to take these, um, I had to take some like reports or something to this guy Colin, and I was like, I was my first day. I was like, uh, not my first day, but I was new at like uh, Westminster. I was working there uh, in the intelligence, and like, um, I said, I said to the woman like, who's who's Colin? And she like, uh, it was this black guy, and she described him, uh, described every part of him apart from the color of his skin. And if she just said the black guy, I would have known exactly. You know, yeah. there's only one black guy down there. You know what yeah. I mean? So if she just, just said the black guy, but instead she, ah, uh, oh, this high, uh, you know, like, <laughs> he's wearing a purple cardigan, like, what the fuck, come on. So it's not racist to say the black guy, I know. you know? Well, you'd say you're not, you're not saying the black guy, and also, you know, we've got a problem with these people coming. You, know? you would like, say a white guy. You'd say a white guy with blue eyes. Yeah, 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 no totally. Joke. But, you know, um, I was teaching at a college, yeah. and uh, that you'd get that. You'd get students complaining about this and that. But, you know, we'd... We'd take it seriously, yeah. but behind closed doors, the minute we are in the office, all the lecturers are like, <laughs> 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 "What? You know? Yeah, we'll do our thing, but yeah, come on, yeah. you know." And you see, yeah. this is this is why I think Donald Trump. You know, people like Donald Trump rise to to prominence because everybody's you, you can't sort of uh, express your dissatisfaction with all these sort of really you know yeah. over the top you know offended people. But the one thing you can do is vote for Donald Trump. <laughs> so that, that's, that happens in private. Yeah. So like you can just you can turn around and like in, in real life you can't turn around and be like oh listen just fucking grow up here you fucking fanny. Yeah. You can't turn around and say that because then they'll be like, oh my god that's offensive as well uh, you're gonna get you know you can't you can't do that but you, you can go and vote for Donald Trump. But but Donald Trump would would say that. yeah <laughs> Donald like, Trump that's, yeah, you're fucking fanny. Yeah totally that's that's why you know you can vote for Donald Trump and show your displeasure <laughs> that way and that's why Donald that's how Donald Trump got elected. Yeah. I swear to God there's people out there who are like you know outwardly seem like nice. Yeah. Right on people, but secretly earlier. Like, yeah, fuck you pricks. I'm voting for Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, I think so, man. I think so. Yeah. I think they're, they're just like, well, fuck all of you. Yeah. This is how I'm going to show my protest to this government yeah. or as a whole. Yeah. Like, or if they're pissed at anything, like, I'm pissed at capitalism. Yeah. Vote Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pissed at vegans. Vote Donald Trump. Yeah. And it's weird <laughs> you know? these days, like, people complain about capitalism as well. Like, they're, they're like, uh, they say it's failing, you know, 
I just don't understand. Like up until obviously coronavirus has changed things, but up until then we're living through a period of just like you you couldn't imagine a period in human history. You could go back to like the Roman Empire, the richest guy would have been like, what, you got fucking light? You got running fresh water that yeah. you can drink? You've got yeah. like a sort you go down to yeah. the supermarket, you, you do a normal job, you can go down to the supermarket and like, buy all these different foods like on your salary. You got this like crazy entertainment coming in on a 55 inch plasma TV. Yeah. Like you've got this uh, communication that connects you to all your friends and loved ones around the world. You can travel and get on a plane. It's so cheap to travel to like, you know, Southeast Asia, wherever you're going. Like it's a, it's a time of just incredible, yeah. incredible wealth for like Prosperity. most people. Mm. Yeah, apart from like you know maybe five percent of the population. Yeah, but for most people, we're just like. But oh. even in ancient Rome, they still complained. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, ancient, ancient Rome, they they should have complained. Even the richest guy <laughs> yeah. didn't have what the poorest guy's got now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. True. True. And that's why I think the easier you get it, you know, one Indian, uh, there was an Indian doctor. Yeah. We're talking about privilege and he's saying it's it's easy to say self-isolation, but yeah. you're not living in a house with 13 people. Yeah. A tiny home. Yeah. It's easy to say wash your hands all the time, but if you don't have running water. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it just shows perspective, you know, yeah. on how, you know, we just take little things, um, self-isolation for granted. Yeah. But yet in places like in poorer nations. Yeah, shanty towns in shanty South towns Africa and, and stuff. Yeah, Man, South that virus, I mean, there's no there's no such thing as, uh, you know, everybody's living, you know, sort of cheek by jowl and like touching yeah. each other all the time and stuff. So, you yeah. know, that's just the, when you're when you're living that densely packed, I think, you know, in Germany, everybody's in their in their houses much more. Even, like they did a, they did a study that showed um, the difference, how many times people in Brazil touch each other during a conversation and how many times people in the UK touch each other during a conversation. In Brazil, it's like 213 times an hour yeah, or something, man. you know what I mean? Yeah. In the UK, zero. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. Do you know, it's funny you said that. <clears throat> I had a lot of Colombian students yeah. and uh, South, Afri uh, South American students from different parts. Whenever they would sit next to me to show me their work... <clears throat> I shouldn't cough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whenever they showed me their work, um, they would put their hand on my thigh. Right. And, the, you know, the first thing is I just went, oh, shit. <laughs> because you just are not used to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what I did is I thought I better just say something. Yeah. So I actually went to a friend of mine who was another lecturer and I said, look, this has just happened. I just want to let you know, um, I'll have a, I'll have a chat. I just thought it was that one girl. Yeah. So I didn't think it was a cultural thing. I just thought, is this girl flirting or doing something for something? I yeah, don't know. Yeah. And you don't know. Best thing is just tell her mate. So if, because in the education system now, it's so hard to teach. Oh, yeah. You can't do anything. Like I used to put my arm around a student and say, good job. You can't yeah. do that anymore. Yeah. You know? So I just let someone know. Until another South American came and showed me their work and did the same thing. <laughs> and it was just part of who they yeah, were. And yeah. I love that though. Yeah. I love that. Oh and yeah. And I think your body sort of needs like as, as humans, we need that sort of physical connection. You know, yeah, and that's, I think that, so. I think this uh, all this that's coronavirus coronavirus isolation and just being being British, being that reserved English thing is bad for people's mental health. I bet there's far more mental health problems in the UK than there are in Brazil, because in Brazil they've got that, you know you know, communal, like touching each other, you know, hugging each other. Yeah, I feel stuff. depressed. I'm going to go touch someone's ass. <laughs> <laughs> hey, feel, cheers, it cheers me up. <laughs> yeah, I feel angry today. I touch his cock. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> They're always happy. You've seen the football. <laughs> oh, Hey, how's how, how would the Premier League be in England now? I don't think it's. I don't think they're playing. Oh, they've matches. canned it. They've just canned it. Yeah, you can't. So there's really no, have. just no audience. They've just canned the game. Yeah, yeah, you can't have like you can't have football with like two meters distance between each player. You <laughs> Can know? you imagine that? Yeah. <laughs> you get foul. You get foul. Like, you know when you got like table football and they're all like <laughs> spaced out like that. That's the only way you could do it. Yeah, that's it's nuts. Yeah, but I think you know football. We're we're really seeing what's uh, what's essential. Uh, Comedy is not essential. Football's not essential. Doctors are essential. So yeah, it's true, isn't it? No, <laughs> but, but I think mad. you know what's mad is I've seen uh, comedians doing like as soon as the coronavirus thing happened, and like obviously all our gigs got pulled. You the know, one online. We all lost uh, thousands. Uh, not so much going online, going and begging, doing this like you know GoFundMe 
stuff um, and saying like, oh, oh really? And these are comedians who've done like live at the Apollo. Comedians that do mock the week. Comedians that do loads of loads of television and like you know obviously loads of gigs and you know so making way more money than me. I still managed to make enough money to save up and stuff. So you know I don't need to. I don't need to. Be, I just think there's so many people. Like, there's homeless people. There's domestic violence. going to be like you know surging yeah. at the moment. And those people need the money. And also, like, poorer countries that don't have the resources to, to deal with this, they're really going to need the money. There's so many charities that are, like, you know, better, need the money more right now. Sure. And these rich comedians are going, oh, please donate to my GoFundMe. You know what I mean? It's like, for me, that's, I don't know, it's, I was kind of disgusted so many comedians did that. Yeah. Like, just save your money like a fucking adult in yeah. case something like that. What do you think? Comedy's going to last forever? Like, yeah. if you break your, if you're, cut your tongue off accidentally or something you can't do comedy just like i've always like saved money because i know at some point i could like break my arm or True. something and not be able to perform mm. yeah no i haven't heard i haven't heard of that so that's that's a bit unless they're doing it to provide something besides comedy no they're doing it to buy because they, they still want to buy, buy their drugs <laughs> turmeric lattes yeah and probably drugs turmeric as well. lattes. <laughs> you know what i mean yeah and get them delivered on delivery yeah. room whatever man oh absolute scumbags yeah no i think i think it i think something like this really does show the color of a culture and of people you know like some i, I saw this meme the other day they were talking about you really know the organization you're working for on how they treat their staff during a pandemic, yeah. like a tragedy. You know, I've got, my friends are still going to work. Right. As in, in the education system. Right. Even though there's no students there. So how do they how I do don't they get do it? it. I just don't get it. Are they delivering the courses online? Yeah, but it means they could do that from home. Yeah. It doesn't mean they have to congregate under one roof. Why are they, why aren't they just doing While organizing home? that. I yeah. don't know. I don't know. I actually thought they were at home and I mm. spoke to a friend the other day and he said, no, we still have to go. Mm. It's like, oh, that's a bit weird. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, man, I don't know. Do you think it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better? I think it's going to get a little bit worse, then it's going to get better and then it's going to come back in cycles because at the moment the only defense we've got against coronavirus is herd immunity when mm. there's uh, so many people. Once you've been infected with it, assuming it's like other viruses, um, you can't get it again. You've got some sort of a, immunity to it. Yeah. So once enough people have had it, then the virus won't be able to spread yeah. through the population because there won't be enough uninfected, like people who've never been infected, won't be enough people who act as hosts that it can yeah. spread. Yeah. So that's our only defense until there's a vaccine, which is, you know, a year away. A year away. Mm. So basically what, like, I think what we've got to do is sort of manage that process of people getting it so that, We'll have enough people. That you know, I, I, I agree with that. And I, I agree because I heard, you know, this, you know, this, this whole flattening the curve, which everyone has heard of and yeah, is quite yeah. sick of. What they're not saying is that that curve is about 60 to 70% of the population. Yeah. So people. it's not getting rid of the curve. It's mm. just flattening it. So our, our medical system can handle, yeah. you know, with their, with, with the ICUs and stuff like that. Yeah. Most of us will get coronavirus, yeah. but we'll get it at a time. It will be like another, it will be like something where we'll get a vaccine for every year. Yeah, yeah. So, and that scared the shit out of me. One doctor was uh, was talking about that and he said what a lot of people aren't hearing is that a lot of us will be infected. Yeah. But it just means we'll have a vaccine for it at that time. We just got to try and hold out yeah. as much as we can. And yeah. some of us get it a lot lighter than others, and we just don't know yeah, that Yeah, it extreme, seems to be a know? huge variation in how severe the symptoms are. Like I've got some friends who've had it and who have it really? right now. Yeah, yeah. So like my Idris mate. Idris Elba? Uh, He's your mate. Has he, has he had it? Yeah, he's got it now. Right, no way. Yeah. I thought you were talking about your friend, Idris. No, nah, no. Nah. You should have just gone on with it, Liam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Idris rang me and he said, he's doing fine and, you know. <laughs> but some of me as well, like my mate Rob had it and he felt like really wiped out for a while, but sort of like a, you know, a not particularly bad flu and recovered. How did he know he had corona? Did he get tested for it? Uh, I'm not sure if he got if he got tested, but he had all the all the symptoms. Maybe maybe he did get tested. And right. then I've got another friend who had it. He's in his 50s and um like had it real really bad. Like had 2 weeks of basically not being able to sleep because of the hacking cough. I'm going to change the sheets every day because he's just soaked through with night sweats and Jeez. stuff, got the fever and everything. So yeah, there seems to be a big uh, difference. And like Boris Johnson at the moment, like he's been admitted to ICU, he's having oxygen and stuff. So, Jeez. and he's you know, I assume fairly healthy. 
Yeah, well, yeah, you see him riding his bike to yeah. 10 Downing every day. Yeah, yeah. But apparently Idris is the healthy one. Like, he's got yeah. it. He, he's still a bit sick, but he's one of the, you know, the guys that is dealing with it okay. Yeah. So, but no, nobody knows. Yeah. And a lot of people, um, <clears throat> a lot of people have no symptoms at all. Mm, true. Like yeah. these, um, what do they call them? That have no symptoms, but can spread it. Oh, Asymptomatic. Right, like, right, yeah. Yeah. Like a carrier. I was, do you think it would be better to get... It's bad to say coronavirus early, so you can get treated if it gets serious because there are enough ICU beds and and yeah. and ventilators. What? Or do you wait? Well, I think early is <clears> when <throat> is when right now is when we're sort of running out of. I mean, in Italy and stuff, in Spain, yeah. they just don't have like people are being brought to. In fact, somebody somebody on Facebook was saying their was it their dad or their uncle was uh, he's like ninety one and so he was taken to hospital and they <sighs> couldn't. They couldn't um, treat him because they didn't have enough. They they had to make the decision to give the ventilator to yeah. somebody else who had more of a you know chance. Greater. Yeah, because they have that thing, uh, quality of life years or something. So if you're 91, chances are you're going to be dead soon anyway. So they give it to the person who's like 40. Yeah, that that must be the hardest thing, hey. I don't know. I find it, find it quite easy. I think I missed my calling. I could be a really <laughs> brutal doctor. Yeah. Ah, you know what? Nobody's getting it. Yeah. Nobody's getting it. Because you know what? I don't like the look of any of you. Yeah. So. <laughs> you're not, you don't shave. You yeah. need to shave. Yeah. Where's Get my the money? Hell out of here. Give me money. You need Give to. Money you need right to do now. a film like that. A doctor like that during a pandemic. Yeah. That's just this Nazi. Hey? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but he's a stand-up as well. Yeah. And he makes a lot of it. Yeah. It's a good good show in that. Have you seen have you seen that film Blindness that's about a pandemic? Of no. Blindness a virus or whatever, contagious blindness. Really? It's, yeah, it's a really good film. That would be scary as hell. Yeah, it is. It's terrifying. And it's called you, Blindness, isn't blindness, it? Blindness, yeah. Really good film. Mark Ruffalo, uh oh. Julia Julianne Moore. Oh. Uh, yeah, really, really good. I'll have to look at that. Yeah. One question I wanted to ask. Oh yeah. Is <laughs> Is there a, you know, after this tragic pandemic and a lot of people have lost their lives, yeah. is there like a a cool off period for comedians before they start hammering in with the coronavirus jokes? No, I think people are, oh, you're going to be sick of coronavirus jokes. If you go to a comedy club <laughs> within like, you know, the first month of like us, of the clubs opening up again, number one, everybody's going to be shit because we won't have done comedy for months. And it is something, it's like a muscle. You got to like, you know, it's like yeah, if, you, if you're true. an Olympic javelin thrower or something, you just go back after like sitting in your ass for three months, you try and throw a javelin, <laughs> you're going to like, you know, just fucking turn around, stab the coach with it. But like also, everybody's going to be doing like just their shitty, hacky coronavirus yeah, jokes and true. everybody's going to have the same angle and stuff. So yeah, you're going to get bored of coronavirus jokes pretty soon. That's why I'm writing jokes about the bubonic plague. That's going to be my angle. Just mix it up. Yeah. Everybody's going to be like, oh, Corona. Well, this guy's talking about the bubonic plague. Whoa. <laughs> and fresh. Keep, keep going back. fresh angle this guy's got, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then I'll get on TV, but the bubonic plague guy. <laughs> the the BP. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so really, it doesn't really, doesn't. there's no real waiting time for it. You just... No. I mean, I think you've got to be careful if you're doing jokes that... Because, uh, I mean, a lot of people in the audience will have lost uh, loved ones. Or, well, I say loved ones. I mean, a lot of the people that are dying are, like, sort of 87 and stuff and had, you know, cancer and diabetes and stuff. So it's not so much loved ones as people you felt obligated to visit. But, you know, <laughs> it's still, you know... It's still... <laughs> It's still sad. See, it's great. So I'm yeah. trying to see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But do you know, people need that. They yeah. need that laughter. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's, you know, there's inherently funny stuff about the about the coronavirus. Probably. <laughs> do you know? I just, I just got this image during World War Two. You know. And people are dying everywhere, and you got this one guy standing yeah. up on a table, <laughs> starts doing all these jokes about it, and yeah, yeah. And you just, I think people like song, and you need that sort of stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally, mm. totally. <clears throat> yeah, it's mad how Spanish flu came right after World War One. Yeah, and man, then that like, was imagine bad. you survive World War One, like most brutal, brutal war, trench warfare, like, trench warfare. Everybody's dying of like illnesses and stuff. It's before antibiotics as well. So if you cut yourself on a barbed wire fence, you like your arm turns green, <clears throat> then you die. So uh, you know, just a horrible, brutal war. You're 17 years old, taken away from like you know your wife and all the rest of yeah. it. You hug your mum for the last time. Then you go and like because just some stupid like posh guys couldn't decide to just be like. Yeah, all right, fine, everything's cool. So you have to do, have this pointless war that then led to, you know, the Weimar Republic and the rise of Hitler and stuff, so it led to even more wars. And, uh, that was and a then, crazy time. You eh? survive all that, 
You survive all that and then you get Spanish flu and die. It killed like, what, 120 million people yeah. or something? People Crazy. are saying 50 to 100 million people. Jesus. And that's after World War One. Yeah, yeah. Like, imagine going through that crazy time. Mm. And what was it? It was an assassination of a of a duke, wasn't it? Of yeah. France, France Ferdinand or something. Yeah, there was all this, uh, you Within know. Within 30 days. Yeah, I mean, that was the, sort of the catalyst for it. But, you know, there's all this, like, that, that's why the European Union was established and why because I think it's important that. because, you know, it's, we need to, we need this, uh, you know, like this government that holds everybody together and we share yeah. everything. We've got, like, common things yeah. between us, you know, and we I shouldn't we shouldn't fight. People forget that. Yeah. That it wasn't called the European Union at the time. It was something else, something about coal and... Uh, there was a Euro uh, European community, was it? Or something EC, about... The EEC. Something like European that. European economic... Because it started off as a trade, uh, a yeah. network of trading. Um, so it's purely commercial and stuff. And then it started to encroach. And I think that's why people in the UK got... got started to get disaffected with it because it was uh, encroaching on all areas of, uh, you know, life. Um, and also, you know, there was uh, there was a lot of immigration uh, to the UK and the government didn't do anything to sort of ameliorate the impacts yeah. of this immigration for people who were already there. Because, I mean, for a lot of people, uh, for me, it's beneficial. There's all these, like, you know, hot Eastern European women coming over. And nice food. Um, nice food. And, you know, like a lot of them are, like, fun. The people that come over are, like, you know, the fun, like, people who want to see the world, want to, you know, make money and stuff. So they're, they're fun people to hang out with. But I can see, you know, if you're a plasterer, if you're a builder, you got like a, a mortgage, you got a wife and kids and yeah. a car and stuff, you got to support all that. And, you're, you're, and then there's and like now you're Polish competing guys. Against... You're competing against <clears throat> Polish guys who come over and they're living like three to a room and stuff. So obviously their overheads are a lot lower. So they can they can do it cheaper. Yeah, true. And also, if you're, you know, if you're a British plasterer, you're probably lazy as fuck. And these guys have got work ethic, you know? Yeah. That's not fair. <laughs> That's not how come they're it's not true. lazy? Well, they're, they're cheating. It's they're true. cheating by being hardworking. <laughs> And those Eastern European women. Oh, oh my God, yeah. Oh, they're Jesus all, Christ. Ah, they're all like, the, like they're off an oatmeal advert. So wholesome <laughs> and so like ball busting oh. and hilarious. They're amazing. People don't understand. Like I, I, I remember going to Europe and I, I was telling my friends, I was mm. like, you know, the, the average girl there is yeah. just beautiful. Yeah. Like we've got hot women in Australia. Don't yeah. get me wrong. But the, the average girl over yeah. there was just Hot. Yeah, and it's mad. And uh, like I went over to Belarus uh, a couple of years back. I was doing some filming over there, and like the the women there, they're all like these tall, glamorous, like just stunning. And the men were all these like shrubby, short guys, like you know, a good sort of you know half a foot shorter than them. Walking, you see them walking down the street. This guy just <laughs> glum looking, squats at a head, all sort of fat, like alcoholic, wearing a tracksuit and stuff. Next, to this totally glamorous woman. I spoke to people over there, and they said like, yeah, there's just such a problem with alcoholism and stuff. And the men, there's this uh, real culture of men won't do the sort of uh, intelligent jobs if you know what i mean right, like right. The, they just want to do the manual labor yeah, jobs yeah. but obviously the economy is like drifting way more towards sort of you know working at a computer so all these women they go to uni they they can do all that so they're making way more money than the men and uh, the men are just you know they're they're just killing themselves and becoming alcoholics jeez which is great for me it is they come over to the oh, man you got comedy you got the height yeah. of a scandinavian like norwegian viking <laughs> You've got it all, man. <laughs> Comedians do get away with it, though. I mean, come on. You, I mean, if I was, if I was a comedian making a living off it, I mean, oh yes, yeah, it's, it's the that's, dream. That's yeah. the dream, really. Yeah. And it's uh, I noticed when I quit my job, I suddenly, you know, uh, my eczema cleared up. I was, I was happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even joking. <laughs> I just, I said, it did. I wasn't stressed anymore. I wasn't stressed. I'm going to go in and get like, you know, yeah. in trouble and having all these millions of things to do. I could just like fuck about. I just needed 20 minutes of comedy and I could work, you know, every weekend. And, <laughs> and it's not work. No, the work is like you have to drive. Sometimes you have to drive long distances. I have to drive to That's Liverpool. That's so hard, or Leo. And, you've you know, got to drive. It's, so but driving's fun. When you've got an Audi, driving's fine. Oh, you know? so hard. It's great. <laughs> it's great. You get free food, you get free drinks, you get free hotel, free travel. It's, uh, you get your it's, you get your groupies it's fun. that follow you everywhere. <laughs> oh, if Stacey's watching, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't. there's no there's no yeah. groupies at all, Stacey. No. Tell no, me, actually, tell me after the show. There, like, there aren't there aren't there aren't really. Everybody's got like, any girl of date. Well, I've been doing comedy. Like they got this idea, like you know, we're just getting blowjobs and stuff backstage. Man, comedians are all we're doing backstage is sitting in a tiny room full of farts, like talking to like other comedians who are all like yeah, bald true. men in their forties. You know what I mean? So it's not. <laughs> It's not like being in Motley Crue. 
<laughs> hey, how how did you get into comedy? What um, was what was it that suddenly that spark went on? Well, I had a, I had a flatmate, um, Oshin, who is an Irish guy, and he said, like, let's do comedy. If I do it, then you have to do it. So I was like, okay. And then he went and did it a few times. He was like, look, you really have to do it. But I was scared. I was like, no, I don't want to do it. I'm scared. And then like, Oshin's mate, Ryan, who I'm still friends with, um, he was running a night. Uh, a comedy night so I went down and did it it was a gong show so you get like uh, you oh, really? got to last as long as you and I made it to four minutes I made it to four minutes which is pretty good for a first gong it was just such an adrenaline rush I was like oh that's really addictive and then my second gig I totally smashed it I did seven minutes which seemed like an eternity at the time but I totally smashed it and uh, I mean obviously the crowd was hot it was a full room and stuff and I just thought I was like oh I'm a natural I'm just like I'm really good at comedy I'm a total natural this is what it's going to be like from now on and then I just ate a turd consistently for years but um, but yeah, that second gig really, I felt like you know I just cracked it, and I was like then for a while I was just chasing that buzz. But if you yeah, but if you didn't have that second gig, then you wouldn't have been chasing it. If that Maybe, happened yeah. on the first night, yeah, who knows? Yeah, I don't think it could happen. I think the first night you're always just so like you don't even know what you're doing. True. So true. It, like it's a real learning process, and people people think it's easy, and it's ve- there's so much like even when you're on stage, there's so much going through your head about. Just reading the room and like you know thinking about what material is going to work next and yeah. you know all the rest of it. I, I'm so interested in that though. Like, and it's funny some of the other comedians I've had on, we haven't really touched on that. Mm. You know, I think Sean did for a little bit, like reading the room, what to do, and stuff like that. But people don't know. Yeah. Judging by conversing with these guys, the more natural and easy it looks, the harder the work that's gone into that. Yeah. Where they're just in that flow, you know. Yeah. And, and to know what your flow is as yeah. well. And like, because everybody starts off doing jokes and it sounds so scripted and yeah. it sounds it sounds like stand-up comedy. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, oh, so anyway, I was, so what's the deal with airline food? You know, all that yeah. sort of stuff. And then like the, the more you do it, the more you get, you become just talking in your own voice. So when you go and see like Bill Burr or somebody like that, it just yeah. sounds like a guy, you're, you're standing next to you at the yeah. bar just ranting, telling you, man, but there's, yeah, like you say, there's so much work goes into that to yeah. sound natural. And also just dealing, like dealing with the room because there's always going to be, especially the clubs I do, like uh, there's always going to be, you know, some stag do's, some hen do's, some office parties where one person has been like, oh, we should go and see comedy. So then like, you know, they're not, that's a table of people who don't have any interest in going to see comedy. Like one person thought it would be a good idea. The rest are like, you know, one of them's doing coke in the toilet. The yeah. other one's trying to shag like the, another girl. <laughs> there are, like, there'll be a couple of guys who want to show off that they're, you know, there'll be drunk women who want to shout stuff out or don't realize. And you get comedy. those hecklers, so those drunk got, hecklers. Yeah, yeah. Deal my hecklers is the you know the, the the toughest thing because you can't slam like if a if a woman like is drunk and like carrying on like a lot of the times you can't you can't slam them like you know if, if a guy joins in and is trying to like you know help by saying stuff or say, do punchlines or whatever you can't just come in and like slam him like you see you know people slamming hecklers like you Michael got, Richards did it's, yeah 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 <laughs> Fuck oh, Jesus! I love what Chappelle said about that. He was like, you know, I didn't say. Like, it, no. I th- Chappelle was like, you know, yeah, he, he was racist, but as a comedian, I really felt for him. <laughs> I was just like, oh god, yeah, that's a that's a horrible death. That he's never gonna, you know, recover from like that. <laughs> I know. We've, we've all been in that situation where you like overreact <laughs> or say the wrong thing, and uh, yeah. yeah, it happens. Yeah, so you, you've had some pretty tough crowds, obviously. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Are you pretty good at now at sort of reading? Like I asked Sean this, is there a, like a automatic response you have for hecklers or do you just feel it on the day? Yeah, I sort of feel it on the day. And quite often the, the put downs that work best aren't sort of funny things, pre-scripted things. It's just being like, ah, you know, shut the fuck up. So if I had to define your comedy, how, how would you define, why do people come to see your shows, Leo? Why uh, do you think? I think it's because it's, uh, it's slightly provocative and also it's countercultural. Right. So I'm poking at the, you know, the sort establishment. Of the establishment. I mean, the liberal establishment, um, like the, the people who are saying, oh, you can't say that, I'm offended, all that sort of stuff. The woke liberal establishment, yeah. I'm poking at them. You need to. Yeah, somebody's got to. Because also, like, all these white woke comedians, they're just shit. Yeah. All these like, oh man, it's just people want something funny. Like that's the thing. I'm I'm funny and I work hard and I think like in comedy, the actual how funny someone is is really undervalued at the moment. You know, mm. people are like, it's got to have an important message. Oh, this show's got an important message, like uh, a, a message against like 
homophobia or racism or whatever. I'm like, who's paying £25 for a ticket yeah. for that show and going in and they're racist? Yeah. They're going to see this show and they're like, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, this really changed my mind. I'm not going to be racist anymore. No, those fucking, the racists aren't going to. It's just people who want that pat in the back. That's right. You know what I mean? That's right. Like, you're not changing anybody's minds. That's right. Like, so my stuff's, my stuff's funny. Like, I, Especially the male feminists. Oh, the male feminists. They're the fucking worst. <laughs> they're the worst. Well, they just want to shag. They the just want the shag, yeah, yeah, don't yeah. You, they, don't you reckon? They think, uh, like, yeah. Well, the, and there's one, there's a famous, well, not not famous, but like uh, notorious on the UK comedy scene, this guy, Chris Coltrane, like a number one feminist. They even mm -hmm. ran a comedy night where uh, where you weren't allowed to do, you had to sign up to this ethos, you weren't allowed to do anything sexist, any material, you weren't allowed to do rape Jesus. jokes. Turns out you weren't allowed to do rape jokes because he didn't want anybody belittling his hobby. He was going around assaulting women. He was uh, he dragged a, a drunk oh, woman. Is this the into guy you were talking about party. earlier? Uh, no, that's Aziz Ansari. Oh, okay. So Chris Coltrane, oh, nowhere near as successful as Aziz Ansari because as well as being a male feminist, he was totally shit at comedy. And in fact, um, the male feminist stuff was was something he was doing to sort of give himself an angle, if you know what I right. mean. So he's really right on. He's like agitprop socialist and stuff. Like all these socialist man. This is what people don't understand about socialist. Like everybody's a sort of scumbag underneath. So you just got to have like some sort of, you can't give people absolute power and you can't like tell, like let people think that they're, you know, untouchable, mm. uh, you know, angels or whatever. Because Chris Coltrane thought he was and he was, uh, he was assaulting women. As soon as he got called out in it, like a woman that he'd assaulted called him out on Twitter and he just disappeared overnight. Just disappeared. <laughs> Website went down. Everything really? just disappeared. All his podcasts, all his shows just disappeared. Uh, hypocrite. So, yeah, so at least at least he, he had the good grace to, to just go. But yeah, it's mm. always the, it's always the male feminists who are, who are you know doing. Yeah. All, I mean, not always, but like you know what I mean. Yeah, it's like we said about Motley Crue. At least they're upfront about you know. And being I think scumbags. I think you, it's impossible to hide today yeah. in yeah. today's culture. Yeah, you're gonna get found out. Mm. You know, like if if you're preaching something and that you're not, yeah, you're gonna get found out. Yeah. Especially today with online community and like Chris. Coltrane? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool second name. Cool surname. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a jazz fan. Yeah, but <clears throat> but yeah, no, it's just yeah. harder today. Yeah. So what's next for Leo? Uh, so for me, I've got <laughs> like um I've got some stuff going on. I've got uh, I'm pitching to Radio 4 through um this uh, production company in the UK. It's like a series of four um things that's going to be stand up each each one with an angle. I don't know. They they contacted. They pit, they pitched it already, and Radio Four liked it, liked the idea. So now I've got to actually work out what we're going to oh, do. Good stuff. Um, and we're filming this thing. We've got a hidden camera prank show that's um, that we did a pilot, and BBC liked it, so we're filming that. And it's like set in rural locations. So all oh. prank shows are normally <clears throat> in the city. Yeah. Um, I'm doing some work with Comedy Unleashed, who are a sort of countercultural thing. Although they they. They wanted me to do some videos from Australia. Their whole thing is like, you don't self-censor. Uh, and they, I did some videos and then they're like, no, we don't like this. Can you make it more lighthearted? And it's like, what, you censoring me? But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know like uh, if I'm going to do those or if I'll do something else. And also I'm writing a, I'm writing a chapter in a book for this uh, think tank. So, oh, cool. Uh, which I haven't actually discussed money with <clears> them, but I'm assuming if they're going to be selling the book, it's going to be paid. Yeah, it, it should be. I don't know how be. much. Man, Watch that contract before you sign it. <laughs> Have a lawyer look over that. Yeah, there's no contract. The hidden so far. camera stuff's good. I, I did a hidden camera yeah. um, to for the police department. Right. And it was to get them workers' compensation. I was the director for it. And we set up this crack house. No way. And uh, we got police um, guys coming in to inform us what it was like and yeah. set up a drug lab. And what they did is they did this competition. Uh, a ride along with the police for the day. Yeah, nice. To the general public. Yeah. And what they the public didn't know is that they were being filmed. Right. And they get taken to this crack house and we had actors and, oh, man, it was great. We had like 12 to 13 cameras yeah. hidden in this place. And the, the way we could hide it is um, through the advice of the cops, they said they steal a lot of uh, like video DVDs and all of that. No way. So we filming just hid, equipment. We hid all the cameras in all this whole stolen yeah. goods in air conditioning vents. And uh, they get into this crack house and the volunteer gets left in there because there's a chase that happens out the windows. And this young girl comes out asking for help and her mother's foaming from the mouth. And, oh, and it was just Jeez. to see the reaction. Man, it went viral. It went yeah. on the news. 
it went to London the next day, uh, this this thing that we did for the police department. Yeah. But I had always, always wanted to do a hidden camera show. I used yeah. to watch Scare Tactics and all of those, all of those shows. And I used to, I used to, my wife we used to joke about it. She goes, "You got to do one one day." Yeah. So when this thing came up, it was for an advertising company. Yeah. And we got the gig. I was just like, "Oh, this is it." You know? <laughs> I wanted to go like the what I pitched them was a lot worse. And they said, no, we can't do that. Can't do this, can't do this. So yeah. then I rewrote it, rewrote it, and we got down to what we needed. But yeah, you can do some, I mean, there's nothing like capturing real fear Yeah. on on people. Yeah, yeah. You know, confusion, fear, they don't know. And they get taken out the back. They get rushed out the back because there's a drug lab and it's dangerous. And there's a 14-person crew with a psych that takes them aside because some of them were shaking. <laughs> and then we interviewed them after. We right. said, you know, the cops deal with this three times a week, um, but they don't get workers' comp here in Western Australia. We're the only state that the cops don't get workers' compensation. Right, right. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were doing this whole thing yeah. you know, for that. But, yeah, so the hidden camera thing, it's good fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I really enjoyed doing the pilot. It was so, so yeah. much fun. We were like beast hunters. So, like... Um, you know, like Loch Ness Monster or the Beast of Bodmin yeah. Moor. So we walk into oh, this pub. We've got cool, the pub man. rigged with cameras and we walk in. We've got like traps and harpoons and stuff. <laughs> and we're talking to locals about, you know, have, you, have your pets been acting strangely and all this? Just playing it quite subtly, trying to like, you know, really convince them. So, uh, yeah. That sounds great. And there's, this, uh, there's a table of women who were really convinced we were talking to them. And then uh, they went away and then we we're just packing up and one of them came back. And uh, she's like, I made you a sandwich. And I was like, oh, brilliant. I'm, I'm, I'm starving. I'd love a sandwich. She, she, opens, she opens this Tesco's bag and it's like, um, it's, got, it's like two slices of bread with an actual cow shit in between and a little flag on the top saying a bullshit sandwich. Oh. I, she realized <laughs> when, she, when she, went, she realized that I was bullshit and oh, when, when she went away, <laughs> so she got like a cow shit out of the field. <laughs> She deserves reward for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool, cool, cool. So, funny. so we might see you here for a few weeks and then back to England. Yeah, yeah. And also the the big that I run this show, uh, Hate and Live. We're doing it in Australia. It's called the Great British Hate Off in the in Australia. But Hate and Live, man, we're like we've filmed a pilot for TV before. We're filming another one. Uh, it's, it always gets stopped. Like the executives stop it because like, oh, we can't have hate. You know what I mean? But I think now. People are ready for a bit of fucking hate. Yeah. Like basically, it's the, it's the thing. The audience writes down what they hate. It goes into a bucket, and then we pull it out, and there's a panel of comedians who have to say why they hate that thing. And ah, like cool. Anything, That's a great idea. Anything can come out of that bucket. So it's a really wild show. And obviously, there's a, little, there's a lot of fun. There's a lot of love in the show. It's not hateful mm. at all. You know, We couldn't have an actual hateful show because that would be horrible. But it's, a hateful uh, eight. Yeah, yeah, it's really fun. <laughs> hateful eight comedians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does somebody in your industry now – how would you adapt to things online at the moment with comedy? Yeah. Or is it a complete, cause you like that instant feedback. I like that instant feedback. And also like, I don't know, like, I'm kind of lazy. And also like with, when you're doing something live, it's got to, I love doing live radio. I love doing live shows and stuff. When you do something live it's it's there, it's right mm. there and you've got to make it good. Whereas like doing, I filmed some videos and stuff with Stacey and like, I'm just like, mm, I don't like, I'll change this and you know, all the rest yeah. of it. So then like perfect becomes the enemy of good. Yeah, you true, know I mean. true. And then you end up not putting it out. Yeah. So I re but I really need, because all comedians are, are getting big from doing podcasts and from putting uh, putting material online. Mm. So I need I need to start doing start, it. Yeah, you should, man. Need you to should. Start doing it, yeah. Well, man, it's been a pleasure having you on. I'm so yeah, glad I, I, I got your name from Stacey and stuff like that. So Thanks, I man. wish you all the best. And man, if you ever in WA again, uh, give us a shout out and uh, I'd love to have you back and we'll Brilliant. see what we'll see what we can do. Nice one, man. Yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> Cheers, great to Elbow meet touch. You. Yeah, yeah. Air hug, whatever. <laughs> Wave through the window. <laughs> yeah, <away>. <laughs> <laughs> Next, you don't know how it's going to go, yeah, right? Yeah. We're probably in this suit. full yes. <laughs> hazmat suit. Bloody hell, who knows, hey? Nah, thanks, man. Thanks for coming <laughs> on. Thanks for having me, man. Great to meet you. <laughs>